Would you take your Bible, please, and turn to 1 Samuel chapter 3, 1 Samuel chapter 3, verses 1 through 21. On May 13th, 2016, something very unusual occurred in London, England, sunlight. If you've ever been over there or seen pictures, they constantly have overcast skies, dreary weather, rain, but on that one day, there was what they called excessive sunlight. As a matter of fact, there was so much sunlight that it made it difficult to read the monitors for the mass transit system, and they had difficulty with the people underground and the people above ground getting their wires together. And they finally ended up having to have runners who would go down and then come back up above ground. Well, tragically, in the nation of Israel, there was a lack of spiritual light. The Word of God had not been spoken in some time. There was no insight or illumination into the Word of God. No prophet could be heard. And for 300 years... They had moved from the dynamic faith of Joshua and that first generation that moved into the promised land to, from experience with God to just performance. As the old preacher Vance Havner once said, the living faith of the dead became the dead faith of the living. But God had a plan. He was going to shine the lamp and speak His voice to a young boy named Samuel. Let's look at it together. Would you stand as we honor the reading of God's inerrant word? 1 Samuel chapter 3, beginning in verse 1. Now the boy Samuel was ministering to the Lord before Eli, and word from the Lord was rare in those days. Visions were infrequent. It happened at that time as Eli was lying down in his place, now his eyesight, had begun to grow dim, and he could not see well, and the lamp of God had not yet gone out. And Samuel was lying down in the temple of the Lord where the ark of God was. That the Lord called Samuel, and he said, Here I am. Then he ran to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. But he said, I did not call. Lie down again. So he went and lay down. The Lord called yet again, Samuel. So Samuel arose and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you call me. But he answered, I did not call my son. Lie down again. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord, nor had the word of the Lord yet been revealed to him. So the Lord called Samuel again for the third time. And he arose and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you call me. And Eli discerned that the Lord was calling the boy. And Eli said to Samuel, Go lie down, and it shall be, if he calls you, that you shall say, Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. Then the Lord came and stood and called, as at other times, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel said, Speak, for your servant is listening. The Lord said to Samuel, Behold, I am about to do a thing in Israel in which both ears of everyone who hears it will tingle. In that day I will carry out against Eli all that I have spoken concerning his house from beginning to end. For I have told him that I am about to judge his house forever for the iniquity which he knew, because his sons brought a curse on themselves, and he did not rebuke them. Therefore I have sworn to the house of Eli that the iniquity of Eli's house shall not be atoned for by sacrifice or offering forever. So Samuel lay down until morning. Then he opened the doors of the house of the Lord, but Samuel was afraid to tell the vision to Eli. Then Eli called Samuel and said, Samuel, my son. He said, here I am. He said, what is the word that he spoke to you? Please do not hide it from me. 
May God do so to you and more also if you hide anything from me of all the words that he spoke to you. So Samuel told him everything and hid nothing from him. And he said, it is the Lord. Let him do what seems good to him. Thus Samuel grew and the Lord was with him and let none of his words fall. And by the way, in Hebrew, it says, let none of his words fall to the ground. All Israel from Dan, even to Beersheba, knew that Samuel was confirmed as a prophet of the Lord, and the Lord appeared again at Shiloh because the Lord revealed himself to Samuel at Shiloh by the word of the Lord. You may be seated. This was my oldest daughter's favorite Bible story as a child. And we had a special routine, and she was probably more of a maintenance girl than the other two kids, but we would read a story, and then we would pray and, and sing a song or two. And finally, uh, Janet or I would go to our room, and we'd leave Kristen there. We'd get the light out with a little nightlight, too, of course. And we'd be just about settled down when all of a sudden I would hear this little girl voice say, I'm just going to close my eyes. And that little sing-songy. And we said, okay, Kristen. A few minutes later, I'm just going to be still. Okay, now go to sleep. And invariably, here it would come. I want a drink of water. Every parent knows what I'm talking about now. And we, she would just go through this whole successive announcement and I, when I would tell the story of young Samuel to her, I would dramatize it a little bit with what Samuel might say like she said to us. But you know, the one thing about Samuel was when he lay down and the Lord spoke, he instantly got up and thought it was Eli the priest calling to him. And this is one of the most remarkable stories in the Bible about how God communicates to us and then how we communicate His Word to others. Now, you often say, how can I know that God is speaking to me? Well, get your ears on and let's listen carefully. Now, first of all, we engage in God's work or His service rather than looking for a vision. Rather than expecting God to speak in a vision or a dream, we do what He's called us to do. Now, that means that you become the right person. And we see this in verses 1 through 3. Samuel was ministering to the Lord before Eli. It's not he was ministering to the Lord because of Eli or even because Eli was watching him, but because, quite honestly, he was worshiping the Lord. He was ministering to the Lord. And that means simply that we recognize that God wants fellowship with us. Now, this phrase, as I've said before, before the Lord, is one of the most important in all of the Bible. And it's often neglected. The Bible says the sin of the young men in chapter 2, verse 17, the sin of the young men, that is Eli's sons, was very great before the Lord. But then it says about young Samuel that he was ministering before the Lord. The first is the issue of accountability. And the second with Samuel is the matter of intimacy with the Lord. Remember the little children's song, Oh, be careful, little, see, little feet, where you go. For the Father, you want to sing it with me? For the Father up above is looking down in love. Oh, be careful, little feet, where you go. And you see, the sons of Eli did not consider that. They, they could care less about what God thought or saw or heard. But Samuel was ministering before the Lord. And he fulfilled what Hebrews 10.22 says, let us draw near 
with a sincere heart in full assurance of faith. Now, he did not yet know the Lord personally, but he had taken steps toward the Lord. And this is the most wonderful thing to me uh, when I deal with children and when I was a parent and a grandparent now, is that God is drawing, God is preparing them to come to faith in Him. And sometimes they may not understand everything, but they are taking steps toward the Lord and to hear Him. And so we become the right person, but we also need to be in the right place. We need to be in the right place. Samuel was lying down in the right place near the Ark of the Covenant, the place of worship of the Lord. But Eli was lying in his own place, meaning his room and his bed. I don't want you to raise a hand or on or admit to anything, but some of us, when we get older, don't want to travel much because we want to sleep in our own bed. How many times have you said, well, i got to get back home to my bed and my pillow. Well, that's the way old Eli was, and he was practically blind as well. He loved his own place. But you see, the, the right place to be in is in the presence of the Lord. The old evangelist Gypsy Smith once said, if you want revival... Take a piece of chalk and draw a circle and step inside that circle and say, Lord, send revival into this circle. In other words, let it begin with me. Right here in this place. You know, we need to show up to grow up. There's something wonderful about being in church with the people of God, hearing the Word of God, worshiping the Lord. And that's why the Bible says we stimulate one another with good deeds And then right at that next juncture, do not forsake the assembling of yourselves together. But you can be near the things of God and it not be dear to your heart. And that's what happened with old Eli and his sons. You know, the Bible says we can come boldly to the throne of grace. That's the right place to be in any situation before the Lord. Jacob said at Bethel, the Lord is in this place, and I did not know it. So I would say to you right here in this place of worship right now, this must be the place. There's no place, any place quite like this place, so this must be the place, as a friend of mine said. But then we do the right things. We are the right person. We're in the right place. We do the right things. He was serving the Lord. And young Samuel did not wait for for an unusual revelation from God. He did what was supposed to be done. He opened the doors in the morning. He closed them in the evening of the house of worship. He poured the olive oil into the lamps. He tended the candelabras with its seven branches in the house of the Lord. And he did whatever Eli needed him to do. And sometimes what we need to do is simply the simplest, the most basic thing that nobody else seems to be doing. I love the fact that it says the lamps had not yet gone out in this Bible. The lamps had not yet gone out is also a picture of the fact that God had not yet departed from his blessing with the nation. It was nighttime, but God was still at work. And so we serve in the small things. And by the way, did you know that God steers a moving car? And some of us are sitting around, we say, Lord, I don't know what to do or where to go or how to do it. And the Lord says, listen, by faith, turn on the ignition of the car, press down the pedal, and by obedience, Go where I steer you to go. God only steers a moving vehicle. You cannot steer very well a car or a truck just standing still. So serve in the small things and also hope in the silent times. 
It was nighttime. And we don't know how late it was. It was probably four or five in the morning because the lamps had not yet gone out. Someone wisely said years ago, don't doubt in the dark what God said in the light. And we all go through a dark time. The mystics used to call it the dark night of the soul. But listen to this word from the Psalms. Psalm 42, 8. His song will be with me in the night, a prayer to the God of my life. That song is many of the psalms that were meant to be sung as well as said. And those songs remind us that our prayers go to the Lord. God is a refuge and a strength and a very present help in time of trouble. But here's the second main truth. We hear God's work word, or let's say his voice as well, even though we may not understand all the details. Do you realize that the Lord spoke four times to Samuel? Now, the first time he went to Eli, Eli said, no, I didn't call. Second time, same thing. Third time, if I were Eli, I would have said, wait, hey, Sam, did you eat some green chilies and enchiladas and some chocolate last night? I mean, are you having some kind of crazy dream here? No, but he finally discerned, and the word discern that is used here in the Hebrew language meant, meant literally originally to taste something, to taste it, to know if it's sweet or sour, to taste the truth of God, to know is this of God or is this a camouflage? to spit out the bones and swallow the meat. And so he discerned the Lord was the one calling with an audible voice to Samuel. The Lord came and called as as at other times, in verse 10. I believe this was a pre-incarnate appearance of Christ called a Christophany. He came and he stood and he spoke with an audible voice to this young boy. Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel said, yes. Jesus Christ said this in John 27, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. If you want to know how to hear from God, you've got to be willing, first of all, to know Christ as Lord and Savior and then to follow him wherever he leads. But his sheep, his people, his believers know when he speaks. But let me give you some helpful hints here. Uh, The word speak, when Eli said, say, speak, Lord, your servant is listening, that word speak means to arrange in order pieces that make sense here. Lord, speak to me so that I know that it's you. Let me give you some things. How do you discern if it's, say, Satan's voice or the Holy Spirit? Well, first of all, God's voice is quiet, gentle, and loving. It's not pushy and irritating, like a mosquito. I remember the first time I went uh, just camping without a tent with a sleeping bag by a stream with my dad in the mountains outside of the Mogollon Rim in Arizona. And we laid down, and I I had no sooner pulled that sleeping bag up than I heard this. You know, it's when they dive bomb. You know, that's when you really get upset. Mosquitoes. Irritating. The Holy Spirit is not like that. He is a dove, not a mosquito. And then God's voice gives time to understand. Sometimes we may not hear it or get it. It's that still, small voice, as with Elijah in a cave. A a still, barely picked up impression. And you have to discern what is God saying. Is this God speaking? It may be barely detectable when you hear it. But then God's voice never suggests that which is unholy, unethical or unscriptural. He never will. 
That's why 1 John says, test the spirits to see whether they are from God in 1 John 4.1. And then God's voice forth works in harmony with his providence. Open doors and closed doors. God never says, try to knock down that door, break, break it in. No, he leads us in his providence, his plan, and his provision. We walk by faith, not by sight. And then God's voice is considerate of others. He won't tell you to do something that harms other people. And then God's voice may not be recognized at first. It took God four times to speak to Samuel. Sometimes it's really hard to know, isn't it? I remember pastoring when I was pastoring in New Mexico, the First Baptist Church of Albuquerque. There was a strange sense after two years there of restlessness in my spirit. And I found myself saying, Lord, are you trying to prepare me for a move? I mean, are you trying to say something to me, Lord? Is this like the mama eagle that uh, stirs up the nests of the little eaglet and, and she makes it uncomfortable for the eaglet? So she is preparing for him to fly. Lord, is that what you're doing? Or is this the roaring lion seeking to distract and devour me and shake me from my confidence in you? Which is it, Lord? And I found myself praying and even going on a prayer retreat to try to hear from God. And eventually, the Lord did speak and remind me that he was the eagle stirring up the nest for a flight. God doesn't usually speak with that audible voice where he sounds like James Earl Jones or Adrian Rogers. He speaks in the spirit to our minds and our spirits. That's why when you read the Bible and in the New Testament, you come across Peter making this statement in Acts chapter 11, verse 12. The spirit told me to go with them, that is to Cornelius, the Gentile captain. The Spirit told me. And then when Paul and uh, his team were going to go into Asia Minor for a missionary trip, in verses 6 and 7 in Acts 16, it says, He was forbidden by the Holy Spirit. And then it said, The Spirit of Jesus did not permit them. So that says to me, there's a certain sense where the Spirit of God permits or doesn't permit that the Holy Spirit within the believer residing, the moment you were saved, He came to live in you. And that, that wonderful Holy Spirit will guide you. But we also grow in discernment of His voice. It doesn't mean that automatically, you know, you say, all right, Lord, speak me. I'm listening. No, you have to grow in understanding of discernment. I used to know a wonderful, godly preacher named Peter Lord, pastoring in Titusville, Florida. One day, they, he held a wedding reception at his own house, and as he went out to get some fresh air, he noticed that one of the wedding ushers was staring intently into the bushes. Well, he thought maybe this guy was planning how to sabotage the groom's car. And so he said to the young man, hey, what's up? And the young man said, did you know that there are 18 different kinds of crickets in your yard? Peter had no idea. He didn't know there were even one. It was even one. Turns out this was a doctoral student at the University of Florida in entomology. That's bug stuff. And he could, with his natural ear, identify 200 different cricket calls. That's growing in discernment of crickets, big time. Uh, I, I want to say to him, hey, get life, you know. But, <laughs> but, you know, what we need to do is we need to grow in our eyes seeing the lamp of God's truth and hearing His voice. We must not be blind and deaf to God speaking. 
or we'll never have His guidance and direction. And the more our minds are transformed by Christ, the more it becomes like the end of chapter 3 of 1 Samuel. And the Lord appeared again at Shiloh because the Lord revealed Himself to Samuel at Shiloh by the Word of the Lord. And so it's in the Scripture. When you're living and meditating in and praying back the Scriptures, that's when God has built a context for you to be able to hear what he's saying. And some of you are saying, oh God, show us your will about our church. Show us your will about our future. Have you taken time to be alone with him and listen quietly to his still small voice? To Samuel, the word of the Lord had to be illumined so that he could see and know. And this is why in the Bible it says in Psalm 119, 18, open my eyes, O Lord, that I may behold wonderful things from your law. So God wants us to grow in this discernment and grow in reading and knowing from the Word what He's saying. But here's a third and last main point. We surrender to the Lord as well as pray to Him in verses 8 to 21. Now, good servants and leaders always encourage further communication. As carnal as Eli was, he had enough good sense and discernment to say, it is the Lord, and he must have thought, he's not speaking to me anymore. He's just talking to Samuel. He had enough sense to tell him, it is the Lord. And Samuel would be, as we said in 1 Samuel 2.35, a faithful priest who would have a heart for him. President Woodrow Wilson, years ago, the time of World War I, made this statement, I use not only the brains I have, but all that I can borrow. And some historians think he should have borrowed a little bit more. But you see, we need wise counsel from other people. God wants to speak through other people, but sometimes He even speaks through the carnal or the ungodly. I mean, He used a donkey, didn't He, with Balaam. And so sometimes the Lord has a way of getting our attention through other people. But it's always necessity for us to hear wise counsel from Christians who've been down the road longer than we have. And then good servants wait before the Lord. We wait on the Lord and before the Lord. We wait on the Lord's timing. We wait before Him in prayer. And we wait on Him in service. We wait and get strength. That's why one of my favorite verses, and maybe yours as well, Isaiah 40, 31, those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. And they shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. And that word, renew your strength, was a Hebrew picture of strands of rope being bound together to make a strong cord. I intertwine my puniness with his power. I wait on him and say, Lord, I need to hear from you. I want to do your will. I choose your will, Lord, above all others, including my own will. Do you realize that when we do that, God does a fresh work in us? And usually that waiting on Him is a time thing. We want Him to act quick, right now, in a hurry, as soon as I ask for it. We don't know, though, by the way, how long Samuel had been serving in that house of worship before God spoke to him. He could have been 12, as Josephus said. I think he was actually younger than that. We don't know how long in the night after the Lord spoke the first time that in the morning the Lord did something fresh. Waiting time is not wasted time. And God answers later that he may answer better as Ron Dunn used to say, great Bible teacher. 
but then also good servants report for duty. Speak, your servant is listening. That's saying, yes, sir. That's saluting and saying, Lord, here I am. I'm at your disposal. That means that we shine God's lamp in verses 11 to 14. God did give him a message that he would do what the unnamed prophet had pronounced in chapter 2, that he would judge Eli and his house because of their bladed sins, defiling the offering, immorality with the women who worked in the temple, and not rebuking his sons. God would judge, and there would not be an old man in their house. And both the sons, Phineas and Hophni, would die the same day. And this is the message God gives again to Samuel. And he doesn't want to hear this. And even more, he doesn't want to tell Eli. He is afraid, the verse, verse 15 says. He waits all the way into the morning and he opens the doors. But the Lord graciously knew not to ask Samuel to initiate the conversation. He knew that Eli would be curious and would ask Samuel and would trust what he had said. And that's how it happened. Do not hide from me, in verse 17. May God do to you more also if you don't tell me everything. That was an ancient invocation of an oath, of a curse. Let me be the victim, or let let you be the victim. Let you be a sacrificial animal if you do not tell me the truth and all of it. So help you God. (laughs) That's how serious Eli was about hearing it. And then Samuel had to speak God's truth. He told him everything, verse 18 says. And thus it was confirmed by two witnesses, this truth. The unnamed prophet and now young Samuel, who was about to be a prophet. Two witnesses confirmed God's message to this old man. That's a tough thing to hear, isn't it? What would you do if God ever said that to you? Now, I've had people along the line after many years of pastoring say, well, I'm a prophet. But let me just say to you, there's something scary about someone who delights in being abrasive and being confrontive. You should never run wanting to be confrontational. I would rather expound Scripture than pound the pulpit. I'm a forth teller, not a foreteller. I'm not going to predict the future, but I'm going to proclaim the truth, the Word of God, and let the chips fall where they may. But I want to tell you that we need to hear what God is saying. The Scripture says that he said everything. Vance Havner said that Samuel was a true prophet of God who answered to no headquarters but heaven. His reputation was laid on the altar of surrender. He was immune to praise or blame, and he was on better terms with heaven than with earth. You say, well, pastor, what is God trying to say to me? I don't know. I'm not your pastor, but I've been a pastor. God's call is always part of his will. And so what is he calling you to do? Confession must accompany conviction. When we submit to God's call, the Lord will invariably show us sins that must be confessed. You know, if Eli had just turned around and said, yes, this is the Lord's judgment, this is his will, and then Eli had gone to prayer and repented of his sin, asked Samuel's forgiveness for being a poor role model, fired his sons for being priests, asked forgiveness of the women they had defrauded, offered his resignation to the nation, God, in his grace, may have changed the entire scenario. But he was just passive in fatalism. What will be, will be. You've got to 
confess and repent, but also then action follows awareness. If God's told you something today, that means there's something he wants you to do. We need to get right what he's saying. And that's one of the reasons I love how this whole chapter ends. Samuel grew and the Lord was with him, verse 19, and let none of his words fail. And everyone knew he was a prophet of God. Whatever God gave Samuel to say, he didn't fumble the ball. (laughs) It didn't fall to the ground. Whatever God said was true and not of the devil because he had heard from God. We're all familiar with the wreck of the Titanic. Movies, books, 1,300 feet below the icy waters of the Atlantic entombed 1,500 people back in 1912. A man named Robert Ballard did a detective's research into what happened to the Titanic. And he discovered that the American freighter, the Californian, was only five miles away from the Titanic as it was sinking. But here's the problem. Here's how so many were not rescued. The captain of the Titanic misstated his position at sea. He missed it. And the Californian couldn't find him in time. We dare not miss what God is saying. He will never lead you astray. Let's pray. Heads bowed and eyes closed, please. No one looking around. God's at work. He's speaking today. And the issue is, what is he saying to you to do, to believe, to act on after your awareness of his will? What does God say? While we're, we're still in prayer, would any of you say, God is telling me something very specific right now as I've been listening to this message? Would you just raise your hand? God is telling me something very specific today. Yes. Thank you. Anyone else? Anyone else? He always has a way of telling us something. Are you willing on a daily basis to go to the Lord, to read his word and say, Lord, speak, your servant is listening. Now, while we just stay seated and are praying, just as you are, as that great hymn says, without one plea, you can come to him today. If you've never put your faith in Christ, I feel like there's so many... Like Billy Graham believed, maybe 70% of all church members have never been born again. I don't know about this place. This is the place God's speaking in right now. If you've never met Christ, now is the best time to make that decision. Just stand up. People will let you out if you're in the middle. They come down this aisle. I'm right here waiting for you. Continue praying. Pray for the person on either side of you. God may be dealing with them in a unique way. Lord, we love you and praise you. We want to live our lives before you and minister to you. Even before we ever minister to others. Here we are, Lord. We want to submit to your call and say, speak. We're listening. Now, Lord, with these friends of mine, Lord, don't let them, uh, let a day go by today that they don't want to hear from you and then wait 
of you. Hear what you have to say. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.